right, so here we go with notes on chapter eight. And this is kind of a combination of chapter eight and just a little chunk of chapter nine, but I'll give you the rest of the notes for chapter eight uh, and chapter nine later. Um, well, sorry. Hang on, I'm trying to get the pen to show up. Okay, so these are words that you guys need to know. I'm not gonna bore you with their definitions. I think you guys are more than capable of looking these definitions up and, and writing them down yourselves. Uh, these are just words that I'm going to be using that you need to know. So first of all, we need to refresh our memories with what is an ionic bond and what is a covalent bond. Remember, an ionic bond is usually a metal bonded to a non-metal, and covalent bonds are just a bunch of non-metals bonded together, and you can have compounds that have both. So in this case, potassium bromide, potassium is a metal, bromine is a non-metal, so this is ionic. Hydrogen is a non-metal, sulfur is non-metal, and oxygen is non-metal, so this is covalent. Sodium, metal, phosphorus, non-metal, oxygen, non-metal. Here, these two non-metals are bonded together, so this is covalent, but they're both bonded to a metal, which makes it ionic, which makes this one both. Sulfur dioxide, sulfur is non-metal, oxygen is non-metal, so this would be covalent. Here we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all of which are nonmetals, so covalent. Here we have calcium, which is a metal. Carbon's a nonmetal. Oxygen's a nonmetal. So we've got covalent between these two and um, ionic between the calcium and the carbonate, so this would be a both. Lewis symbols, just to refresh your memory on this one, this is where you take the symbol and you put the valence electrons around the symbol written as dots, so like chlorine has seven valence electrons, so it would look like this. Make that one a little darker. And remember that elements want to gain, lose, or share electrons so that they look like a noble gas. And by looking like a noble gas, I mean that they are isoelectronic. So like neon has eight valence electrons, or ten electrons total. Chlorine, to look like neon, uh, I'm sorry, fluorine is going to look like neon, because fluorine has seven, no, nine valence electrons. So it's going to gain one more right there so that it is isoelectronic to neon. So we're going to put these chemical species. Remember, a species is just an atom or a molecule or a compound or an element or something into its isoelectronic groups. Iso meaning same electronics, meaning same number of electrons. So we just need to figure out how many electrons each of these guys have. So nitrogen normally has uh, seven electrons. So when it's a negative three, that means it's going to have 10. Potassium normally has, dig it up a periodic table here. Potassium normally has 19 electrons. So it has lost one, which means it has 18. Calcium normally has 20, so it's lost two. So that gives it 18. Oxygen normally has 8, it has gained 2, so that puts it at 10. Fluorine usually has 9, it has gained 1, so it has 10. Neon, no charge, so it has 10. Bromine doesn't have any kind of a charge, so it's going to have 35 electrons. Krypton with no charge has 36 electrons. I'm pretty sure this bromine was supposed to have a negative 1 charge. Uh, scandium usually has 21 electrons. It's lost three, so it has 18. Sodium usually has 11, it's lost one, so it's down to 10. Aluminum usually has 13, it's lost three, so it's down at 10. Selenium usually has 34, it's gained two, so it's at 36. Magnesium usually has 12, it's lost two, so it's down at 10. So the isoelectronic groups, you have isoelectronic to neon, would be your nitrogen, uh, oxygen, fluorine, I, sh I should say nitride, oxide, and fluoride, of course neon, uh, sodium, aluminum ion, and magnesium ion. All of these guys, they're not the same atom because they have different numbers of protons, but they, they are isoelectronic because they all have 10 electrons. And then you've got the guys that are isoelectronic to 18, I believe, is argon. Yes. So isoelectronic to argon, 
is potassium ion, calcium ion, who else is 18? Scandium ion, and that's it. And then I think I really do think that this bromine was supposed to be a negative one, which would then make him 36. And so all the guys that are isoelectronic to krypton would be the bromine ion, so bromide, krypton, of course, and then selenide. So ionic bonding specifically, electrons are transferred from an atom with low electronegativity to one with a higher electronegativity. Uh, the bond results as... Um, the electrostatic attraction between two oppositely charged ions. They are arranged in a crystal lattice, and there is an energy contained in those bonds, and it's symbolized with delta HL, and that's how much energy you'd have to put into the compound to separate the solid ionic compound and gaseous ions. So if we had like sodium chloride, and we had a lattice of lots of sodiums and lots of chlorines all put together into a crystal, the delta HL would be the amount of energy that would have to be put in to break this bond right there and separate it into sodium ions and chlorine ions. So what's the lattice energy again? Uh, lattice energy is, like I said, it's the energy required to break the bond, to break an ionic bond, and a higher lattice energy results when the atoms are smaller or when there's a higher charge, meaning you're exchanging more electrons. So like the smaller lithium fluoride would have a stronger lattice energy than say sodium chloride, even though they have the same charges because lithium fluoride is smaller. Or if we were to compare lithium fluoride to, or let's do sodium chloride comparing it to magnesium oxide, even though these two are about the same size, the magnesium oxide is going to be stronger because these guys exchanged two electrons, whereas sodium chloride only exchanged one. And uh, higher lattice energy means that the ionic compound is more strongly bonded, and it also explains why the ionic compounds are so brittle and hard, because this lattice energy means that this bond is really strong and difficult to break, and so instead of breaking, they just... Uh, the actual individual formula units just shatter basically and you have little bitty individual you know one magnesium bonded to one oxygen and so instead of bending like metals do they break so in each of the following pairs identify the one with the higher lattice energy potassium chloride versus calcium sulfide well potassium is a plus one chlorine is a minus one calcium is a plus two sulfur is a minus two so this one's stronger because it has a higher charge Lithium fluoride, sodium chloride, we already talked about this one. It would be lithium fluoride because it's smaller. Fe2O3 versus manganese um, dioxide. Iron's a plus three, oxygen's a negative two. Manganese is a plus four, oxygen's still a negative two. So in this particular case, the one that exchanges more electrons, here we're exchanging six electrons and here we're only exchanging four. So this one is going to be stronger. And then calcium oxide versus calcium chloride. Calcium in both cases is a plus two, but here we have oxygens a negative two and chlorines a negative one. Yeah, we've got two of them, so we're exchanging two electrons regardless, so it actually ends up being this one because it is smaller. So how do you know what the charge is going to be? Well, remember representative elements are gonna follow that hill of oxidation numbers. If you remember that thing, I'm impressed. But if you don't, then here it is. Group numbers on bottom. And then the charges go on top. Plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. And these are the uh, charges of the representative elements. These are the elements in these um, groups right here. When they are in an ionic compound, when these nonmetals over here are in covalent compounds, they do not follow the hill of oxidation numbers. Transition metals are a little weird. Uh, they can be a lot of different things, hence the term transition. Their, their oxidation state can change. And uh, lead and tin, which are actually in group 14, they also fit into this because they can have charges of either plus 2 or plus 4. And the reason for this is that their valence electrons is that highest field S sublevel, which gives you two electrons to lose. But you can also occasionally lose one or more of their D electrons. 
And so the charges for transition metals will range from plus one all the way up to, in some cases, plus seven, but usually it doesn't go much above plus four. So these are showing you the different possibilities for the electron configurations of iron. So this normal state of iron is 4s2, 3d6. Well, when iron forms a plus two charge, it loses these 4s2 uh, electrons and just leaves behind 3d6. When it becomes a plus three, it loses those two plus one of these and becomes just 3d5. Lead, this is its normal state where you have 6s2 and then the 4fs and the 5ds and then your 6ps. When lead does the plus two, it loses the six, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, scratch that. It loses the six P2, and then when it loses the, or when it becomes the four plus, it loses both the S's and the P's, leaving behind just the F's and the D's. So we're gonna write the electron configurations for chromium with a three plus and tin with a four plus. So first you need to know what the base electron configurations are. And for chromium, chromium is one of our weird exceptions. Chromium is usually argon and then 4s1, 3d5 instead of 4s2, 3d4 is one of those weird exceptions that I told you guys you needed to know. Um, and so when it does its plus three thing, it's going to lose this 1s electron and two of the d electrons. And so this is going to be the electron configuration for chromium plus three. And then for 10, it's usually krypton and then 5s2, 4d10, and then 5p2. And so when it does plus four, meaning it loses four electrons, it's gonna lose these two p's and the two s's leaving behind krypton 4d10. So covalent bonding. This is where you have two or more atoms sharing electrons, and like I said before, it's usually nonmetals bonded to nonmetals. The Lewis structures that we'll review in a second show your shared electrons and the lone pairs. And whether or not a covalent bond is polar or nonpolar is determined by the difference in electronegativity values. If there's a difference between 0 and 0.4, then it's a nonpolar covalent. If the difference ranges from 0.4 to 1, then it's a polar covalent. If it's between 1 and 2, it is really, really polar covalent. And if it's anything above 2, then it's ionic. Well, what if it falls exactly on one of these things? You know, what if it is exactly 0.4? Well, that means it's either on the kind of polar side of nonpolar or it's a really weak polar. Or, you know, if it's exactly 2, then it's so polar that it could possibly be ionic. Uh, so you know, we, I wouldn't really ask you questions about numbers that fall right on the line. So what about the whole entire molecule having a dipole moment? Well, not only do you have to have a polar covalent bond, but there has to be a lack of symmetry within the molecule itself. Hey, that's my cue. Okay, I'll finish up part two of this in just a second.